when to operate, that's something that we really need to discuss. So what is our present understanding? We know that overwhelming amount is treated non-operatively, and rightly so. Why so? Because one is our understanding of the geometry of these fractures is not great, and it's a relatively unfamiliar surgical terrain. Add to that, these are relatively rare fractures. So you heard Prof saying that they probably see a few, around 10 per year in a busy trauma setup. Well, we at Sancheti probably see around three or four which merit surgical intervention in an entire year, and that's really less. What is more important is that whenever you see a scapular fracture, you should start thinking about associated injuries because these are usually high velocity injuries. So don't miss out on other life threatening injuries just trying to look for the scapular fracture. So if we are going to fix these fractures, what do we need to know? One, the osseous and the neurovascular anatomy, the deformity patterns which will take place, what is the concept of the superior suspensory complex of the shoulder, what is a floating shoulder, and how do we fix it? We know that the entire scapula is in close proximity to the brachial plexus. So when we are going to approach it, we need to be very careful if in the process of fixing the fractures, we don't want to cause any inadvertent damage, which is going to be deterrent for the patient in the years to come. Also, get this very clear that all fractures do not require surgical intervention. So what we need to identify is what are stable patterns and what are unstable patterns. And lastly, but not the least, is what are the deformity patterns which can take place. So this is this beautiful paper by Peter Cole where they have described about indications of surgical intervention for scapular fractures and how to assess these patients in the outpatients. So if you look at this patient, first thing is you'll see that the trapezius fold starts drooping. The injured nipple is at a lower level, so the nipple droop sign which is present. You can see that even when you look at the patient from behind, the normal loss of the medial border of the scapula is lost. Whenever you see a patient like this, you should then direct your attention to the superior suspensory complex. What is the SSC? The SSC basically maintains a normal relationship of the scapula and the upper extremity, which allows good movement. So what comprises of this? If you look at the superior suspensory complex, there are three components to it. You have the clavicular, acromioclavicular, acromial strut. You have the clavicle, coracoclavicular, and the coracoid strut, and the confluence of the three processes, which is at the articular margin. So now when you have two out of these three which are involved in a fracture scapula, that's what would be called as a floating shoulder. And a floating shoulder is a double disruption as I just discussed. Now, whenever you see a double disruption of a superior suspensory complex, you have to consider fixation of either one component. When you fix one component, it's very likely that the other component may fall in place and you can treat it non-operatively. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, if the other component does not fall back in its position, you will have to go ahead and fix the second component as well because these are the ones which require mandatory fixation. Trying to understand these fractures has always been a big challenge. The Eidberg classification is one of the commonest used classification, but it speaks about the body fractures and the articular segment. Kuhn has described the classification for the acromial process. Add to that, you have a separate coracoid fracture classification which is there. But understand that we are trying to look at one particular bone and we have so many subclassifications. So which is not helping the cause because all of them have poor inter-observer agreement. And that is where in 2012, the AO ASIF group, when they came up with this relatively simple classification where you're either looking at the body or you're looking at the articular segment or you're looking at the processes. And that allows you to determine your fracture management. So if you look at your indications, if you want to remember one particular slide from the entire talk, this is the slide that we are looking at. Your glenopolar angle should be less than 20 degrees. That's one thing that we are going to discuss in detail. The deformity of the body of the scapula should be less than 45 degrees. And the lateral translation of the spike should be 15 to 25 millimeters. If you're seeing that these criteria are there, there is a very good chance that your patient is going to require surgical intervention.
So what is the glenopolar angle? If you look at the articular surface alignment of the glenoid in relationship to the scapula, all you need to do is draw two lines. One from the cranial most portion of the articular surface of the glenoid, that's the apex, and you're going to drop it at 12 o'clock position along the inferior portion of the six o'clock portion of the glenoid. The other line subtends an angle, which is from the cranial most portion of the glenoid to the caudal most portion of the body of the scapula. Normally you would have an angle which is less than 30 or between 30 to 45 degrees. And if you have patients who have an angle less than 20 degrees, these are going to be there with a very poor outcome. So this is one thing which is very important. Second thing, if you look at the lateral column spike, if it's more than 15 millimeter dis uh, displaced, these are the patients you would again think about surgical fixation. And lastly, on an actual view, if you look at the body of the scapula, and if you have an angulation of more than 45 degrees, these are the patients, again, you would think for surgical intervention. So if you have understood this, then why is it so difficult to just go ahead and operate? Because understanding fracture patterns is a challenge. So what looks like a benign fracture on a plain X-ray on a CT scan is a completely disrupted fracture. And that's where you've heard the previous speaker speak in the morning about the concept of a 3D print, which I'm sure that in the years to come is going to reach India. In fact, I know a couple of surgeons in Hyderabad who are actually trying out 3D printing for scapular fractures before for pre-op planning. So what is done is on basis of your 2D images, that data is then fed into a 3D printer. You actually get in a model which is a three-dimensional model depending on the correct orientation and the size of the patient. You can do a pre-op templating. You can try your implants, the unsterile implants, and then you can go in with a much clearer roadmap rather than jumping in and then trying to fix the fracture. Professor has already spoken about the approaches, so I wouldn't go into details. But yes, what was true is that these ideal implants, the boomerang plates, the low profile plates, the flat plates, these are not available in India. So what is it that we routinely use for fixation of our fracture scapula? The AO acetabular set is something which is really helpful. Because if you look at the 3.5 contour of the plate, they go very well across the lateral border. You've heard him say that the distal radius low profile plates are something else that you could use. Or if not anything else, then just the 3.5 reconstruction plate is something which can be beneficial. So if you look at various case examples, let's say that this is a patient, young patient. Most of the times, these are young patients who will land up on table. You have an anterior rim avulsion fracture. If it's a big chunk, well, it's no challenge. All of you have done an anterior rim avulsion fracture at some point of time where you're going to use either cannulated screws, partially threaded screws, going to go through an anterior deltovectoral approach, and you're going to fix them. You can do these arthroscopy assisted, but the challenge comes in when you have these patients who have a thin sliver of bone, and you're not too sure whether you're going to actually go in and use in a screw, because if you're going to use in a screw, it's just going to cause combination of that fragment further, and that's going to land up in a soup. These patients can very well be treated arthroscopically, but the same principles can be done in an open procedure as well. So this is viewing from above. You can see that that fragment has been elevated completely. And after elevation of that fragment, you do a standard bank art repair, which is going to be either a trans osseous repair or a pulley technique repair. Although this is a trauma session, what I wanted to say here is it's not a question of doing it arthroscopically. You could very well do the same principles by doing it in an open format. If you look at this patient, this is a bilateral scapular fractures in 21-year-old. It's very, very similar to what Professor Bindra showed. And here you can see that there's a disruption of the articular segment as well as the medial border of the scapula. And this is what we had done for him. We had stabilized the medial border. We had gone ahead and we had mobilized him early. And this is his range of motion. And that really gave us a good outcome. If you look at a patient like this with multiple fracture lines running in, sit back and try to understand the fracture patterns better. Because here you can see that you have involvement of your medial border of the scapula, you have involvement of your articular surface, the coracoid process, and your acromioclavicular joint, not the joint, but the lateral end of the clavicle. 
So in other words, this is a double disruption of the superior suspensory complex and this merits mandatory fixation. You can further confirm your findings by going ahead and get a 3D CT scan. So all fractured scapulars who require surgical intervention until and unless proven otherwise will get a 3D CT scan. This is how we do our scapular fractures. I do them in lateral positions. I've done them in prone position as well, but I just feel the reduction becomes that much more easier when you have in lateral position and the entire arm is free. You can see that the medial border is well apposed. The deltoid has been reflected. The infraspinatus has been elevated. You do a provisional fixation and then you go ahead and put in a recon plate. But in spite of putting in a recon plate, you can see that there's a significant articular step off. That means it tells us that that by itself is not enough. As a second stage, through an extensile anterior deltopectoral approach with a subscap takedown, you can see that there is more than 40 degree angulation of the articular surface, and that is where you fix the glenoid fragment, you fix your lateral end of clavicle, and restore your anatomy back to normal. So effectively, if you want to understand how do we treat scapular fractures, you can simply divide them from inferior to superior. If you're looking at the body, exclusively the body, most of the times you will not consider surgical intervention. If you're looking at the lateral margin and yes, a displacement of more than 15 millimeters, some of them will require surgery. And yes, if there is articular segment involvement, most of the times you will offer them surgical intervention. So in summary, even now, most of the scapular fractures will be treated non-operatively. If you consider surgery symptomatically, it is a rewarding surgery. It is an inhibition to go ahead and fix the fracture. There are limited indications, as we spoke about the glenopolar angle, the angulation of the body of the scapula, and the superior suspensory complex disruption are the main three indications which you need to remember. At the end of it all, we still are not very sure when to fix, when not to fix. But if previous three indications which have been mentioned by Peter Cole, if these are present, these patients will do very well at the end of surgical.